Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We will get started. Uh, this is the session that we attempt to try and have a discussion around taxation. It's a very broad topic because the world of taxation is huge. We're going to start a little broad and then hopefully narrow down to how, how we actually deal with the large technology companies. And we're going to try very hard to look at this the issue of taxation from the point of view of majority world or global south countries. Um, the conversation around taxation is more important than ever now in light of the fiscal squeeze that many countries are facing in the global south. Uh, high inflation, high devaluation of local currencies, COVID have all meant that the need for revenue is very high. There is also a conversation around data and digital justice when a lot of the content is provided and the user base is also from the majority world, yet very little of the revenue from taxation goes into those countries but are collected by a handful, including America and China. This is a timely conversation. There have been many global, regional, and national level efforts to also try and collect some of this tax revenue. Uh, there is no sort of winner at this point. There are various options which we will present and we will talk about. Um, to do this, I'm joined by two speakers on, uh, online and two here uh, with me on the podium. Uh, Online, we will have Abdul Mohid Chowdhury, who is Senior Program Officer at the South Center. The South Center is an intergovernmental organization of developing countries based out of Geneva, and they help developing countries to combine their efforts and expertise to promote common interests in the international arena. They conduct extensive work on international tax cooperation through the South Center Tax Initiative. Uh, to my right, we have Dr. Alison Gilwald, who is the Executive Director of Research ICT Africa, which has been a long-standing evidence producer about the state of connectivity, about the state of digitalization and digital rights across Africa, and who we work closely with. And next to her, we have Ms. Gaini Hurule, who is a senior research manager at Learn Asia, who is working on some of the tax issues that Learn Asia looks at. Online, we also have Matthew uh, Bongjbola, who is the coordinating director at the Federal Inland Revenue Service of Nigeria. Uh, and Nigeria is interesting because they have a tax that's a country specific tax. But Matthew also is co-chair of the UN Tax Committee, who also has another proposal on tax. So he's a very interesting sort of, he sits on both sides. And finally, uh, we are also joined by Victoria Hyde, who is the policy and communications manager of the Asia Internet Coalition. Now, the AIC is an industry association representing the internet industry across the Asia Pacific. Their members include Meta, Google, and Amazon, so certainly all the big platforms. And to my left is my colleague Isuru, who will help, uh, who's a uh, research manager at Learn Asia, and will help with online moderation. So to get us started, what we've asked is actually for Guyani to set the stage, because I think this is a conversation that needs a little bit of data and framing to get into. Uh, oh yes, before that, we have the pleasure of actually quickly asking, this is meant to be a debate, because there are actual options humans face, I mean, in these countries. But first, we want to do a quick Slido. Uh, if you could please go to www.slido.com. This is, I promise, two minutes or less, even the online audience. And enter 2238752 and fill this poll. And the question is, should countries be exploring policy options to impose taxes on big tech? This is not necessarily an obvious answer because many have talked about, well, let's not tax because the benefits of digitalization are so high and using the platforms. Let those actually, the economic revenue from that compensate instead of taxes. So what do you think? And we want to see if you'll change your mind at the end of this uh, uh, sort of 90 minute conversation. 
The code again is 2238752, sorry. Okay, so about 70, just under 20% sitting on the fence, but a majority, 75% saying, yes, we should be uh, taxing big tech. Right, thank you. Uh, let's move on. As I said, I've asked Gayani to show us sort of a little bit of why this topic is important and maybe uh, present the policy options that are facing uh, developing countries in particular right now. Thank you, Helani. Um, if I could just get my slides up, wonderful, okay. So we've very helpfully called this session uh, Taxing Tech Titans. Uh, what I'm trying to do here is, as Helani said, just frame the conversation and give you a sense of what the different policy options are. So what you'll see is that many of the internet users in uh, the world right now actually live in the global south. So to give you a little bit of context, uh, ITU data indicates that over 60% of the world's population, that's about 4.9 million billion individuals, are now online. But we're seeing that a majority of the internet users now reside in the majority world. And India, Indonesia, Brazil, Nigeria are amongst the countries where most of the internet users in the world live. Now many Sorry, many uh, apps, um, sorry, just give me one second. I'm having a little bit of a tech issue. Sorry. I'm not sure why this is happening. All right, I think we're good. Okay, yeah. So if we hone in on the case of India, for example, LearnAsia's national representative survey that we conducted in 2021 that was in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis found that 47% of the population aged 15 and above were online. And given uh, India's growth trajectory, which was uh, very stark, this is likely to be greater now. Uh, but then the question really arises, what apps and platforms were they using? And we found that the most used apps and platforms when we did our survey was YouTube, Facebook, messaging apps such as WhatsApp and Viber, and Instagram. So then the question again is, what's the common thread between these? One perhaps is that they are social media type apps, but the other is also that they are large, uh, that they are products of uh, large tech MNCs. And despite operating and having users in the global south, uh, many of these platforms still largely derive their revenue from the global north. So Meta, who we've given an example from here, derives 70% of their revenue from the US, Canada, and Europe in 2022. But uh, while the global south accounted for a smaller percentage of revenue, that's about 30%, it's still sizable and therefore quite lucrative for tech companies. So for example, if you look at the uh, graph on the right, you'll see that uh, Meta made $24 billion in revenue from the Asia Pacific in 2022. And this number doubled over four years. So this market is not only sizable and lucrative, but also growing. Now. Despite making sizable revenue from the global south, big tech often lies uh, outside the formal tax nets in the countries in which it operates. And this has multiple impacts. The first, of course, is a no-brainer. It, imp it impacts government revenue. And then if the funds were present, it could go into a consolidated fund, which then could be used to achieve other developmental targets, education, healthcare, and whatnot. But it can also impact the competitive landscape. So we in Sri Lanka, for example, uh, have seen calls from the local ride hailing operator. To give you context, there's a local ride hailing operator, Pick Me, and then another, an Uber, which operates in the same market. And we found that the local ride hailing operator has been calling for the country to introduce digital taxes uh, because they claim that they were paying more taxes than Uber, which impacted their cost structures, which then in turn created an uneven playing field. So we've seen calls from the local tech companies to impose digital taxes to kind of create a level playing field. Now, despite the benefits, some countries have been quite delayed in implementing digital taxes. Uh, therefore, taxation of the digital sector 
has been limited to long tax sectors like telecom and IT imports, for example. And then um, these issues have been confounded by the lack of agility associated with the legislation of some countries. So for example, in many countries, uh, the Income Tax Acts deems it necessary for a company to have a physical presence in the country, uh, which then allows for companies like Google and Meta and whatnot who don't have a physical presence in the country to stay outside the tax net. But it's also worth mentioning that this issue of digital taxation is also sort of, um, there's an underlying issue around defining and sizing the digital economy. And this is a complex one that uh, many countries, even countries in the global north, have found quite challenging. And we've found that organizations like the IMF, OECD, UNCTAD, ADB, and so on, have also been grappling with trying to size this digital economy and figuring out how to define the bounds of it. Um, so in fairness, it is a tough exercise, possibly one that countries, particularly ones in the global south, are waiting for some direction on, and in the case of digital taxation, there have been multilateral processes in place, which I'll get to in, in a minute, that countries may have been taking a little bit more of a wait and see approach to. However, there are several policy options for countries on how they can uh, tax the digital economy. Uh, I'll start with talking about domestic measures, and there are a range of options within this. Um, one is using direct taxation measures, uh, such as digital services taxes, which is where you tax a company based on the revenue that they make from a country. Another is an indirect tax or a consumption tax, where which you levy a specific uh, tax based on the point of consumption. You'll see this in the case of digital service VAT, GSTs, and whatnot. Uh, but just for the purpose of streamlining our conversation today, we'll focus on the direct taxes. And you'll see that um, countries in the Global South have, several countries in the Global South have already implemented these direct taxes. Um, we've illustrated some cases from South and Southeast Asia. So we've seen that India, Pakistan, Nepal, Vietnam, and Malaysia all have some sort of measure in place, but they're also uh, quite heterogeneous. Um, and even if you hone in further on digital services taxes, which is one subcomponent of the direct taxes, you'll see that they uh, do tend to vary quite a bit. So even in South Asia, you'll see that um, they're, they're called different things. They're called the equalization levy. You'll see it being called the fee for offshore digital services, but it really boils down to the same thing, where countries uh, tax companies on the percentage of revenue that they derive from the country. And if you look at the three systems in place on screen, and sorry this is a little wordy, but uh, we wanted to make sure that we just put out all the information here that we can go back to, uh, you'll see that um, India, Pakistan, Nepal, they're quite different. Um, and this actually does speak to the benefit of, one of the benefits of a local DST in that um, it's customizable and flexible, which is what you don't really see in some of the other uh, multilateral or treaty-based options that we'll talk about later. But it also speaks of a cost to companies because they have to deal with different tax regimes being in place in different countries and therefore have a quite high transaction costs in trying to pay taxes. So compliance costs are quite high. So if we just look at the differences in these three, um, these three country measures, you'll see that um, they have different tax rates. So India and Nepal, for example, have a tax rate of 2%, while Pakistan has 10%. Um, there are some countries that have uh, taxability thresholds, so like revenue flows to protect small businesses, but it is absent in other countries like Pakistan. Then you'll remember that I spoke earlier about this issue of archaic income tax acts. Pakistan has amended that act to allow for uh, tax, digital taxation through their existing uh, act, but India and Nepal have introduced separate legislation outside the taxes uh, sorry, outside the acts to impose these taxes. So you'll see again the approach to digital taxation, even through these DSTs, uh, can be quite heterogeneous. Right. Now, while these uh, domestic measures have been uh, put in place and discussed, there have also been parallel efforts to explore treaty-based options. Uh, and this is the benefit of having a treaty-based option is that it reduces the risk of double taxation. And there are two main treaty-based options on the table, one put forward by the UN and the other by the OECD and G20. 
And there are various different subcomponents within this as well, but I'll focus on the two elements that are seen as alternatives to the digital services taxes that we discussed earlier. That's Article 12B in the UN Model Tax Convention and Amount A in the OECD G20 Inclusive Framework to Pillar Solution. So there are a couple of differences even within this, and again, I won't get into too much detail here. Hopefully, we'll uh, be able to talk about this in more detail in the discussion. But it's worth noting that the UN's Article 12B is to be implemented through a bilateral treaty negotiation. Uh, there has been some conversation about a multilateral option, but right now, what is clear to us and what is available in the public domain is this bilateral uh, mechanism. So, for example, if a country X is headquartered in the U.S. and uh, a country, well, sorry, if a company is headquartered in the U.S. and a co company um, would need to have a, a, a country would need to have a treaty with that particular country to tax uh, the company that's within that sort of locality, and this builds on the domestic measures while reducing. Uh, the risk of double taxation, it can be quite cumbersome and impractical in its current form. Uh, then there is the OECD's Amount A Convention, which is the most well-known and debated in the public domain. This is the multilateral convention. It defines which companies are eligible not by listing services, which is what you'll see in the case of Article 12B and in many of the local uh, digital services taxes that we saw earlier, but by providing revenue and profitability thresholds both at a global level and also at a market level. And it has a fixed rate across countries, which is attractive to platforms. But there are also sort of negatives, which we'll get to later. Now, while these different uh, options have their relative merits, um, they have uh, the potential to give countries different quantums of revenue, which I hope Abdul will have uh, will be able to comment more on. They'll have different impacts of competition, and they'll have a lot of different costs of implementation, be it negotiation costs, compliance costs, and so on. I won't get into a lot of detail here, but hopefully we'll hear about this more from our speakers. So just before I hand the floor back over to Helani, I'd like to highlight that there's a crucial decision point that countries need to make in the next few months. The OECD and G20 has indicated that they hope to implement their multilateral so solution in 2025. And, ah, sorry and um, have asked for countries to sign up for the Amount A Convention by the end of 2023. And this is important for several reasons. Uh, this could be the beginning of a multilateral system, which is a first best solution. But if countries sign up for this program, they agree not to impose domestic measures until the end of 2024. And then there's the actual implementation of the convention is contingent on the US signing this. And that's a lot of power in the hands of a single country. So there's some apprehension and skepticism on this as well, which perhaps we can uh, talk about in more detail. So it's for this reason that we thought that we'll center our discussion on whether countries in the Global South should sign up for the OECD and G20 multilateral convention by the end of 2023. I'll stop here and hand the floor back over to Helani. Looking forward to hearing more from our speakers. Thank you. So just to clarify, Gayani, uh, December last year, I believe, was the initial deadline set for the negotiations to happen, the US and countries to agree on the proposed taxation with the OECD. That didn't happen. And now, December this year is the new deadline. So that the options for countries is if you sign up to the OECD convention, you can't do anything until end of 2025. Uh, until end 2024. 20, so it's okay. a one-year goal post that keeps getting shifted. That keeps getting shifted. OK, so you can't then go ahead and do some local taxation and so on and exactly. so forth. However, there are countries that have done national-level taxation policies and said in the policy itself, until such time OECD agreement is reached, this shall remain in play, right? Yes, possibly. And um, there are also other countries who have implemented their own DSTs and then signed up for And then the still solution. signed up for the OECD Afterwards, and waiting. Okay. Because what, the, what that convention uh, specifies is that you can't 
implement a DST after you sign right. up for it. So they've been quite shaky. For these countries, like, so presumably you said India has a national level digital services tax, a DST. Yeah. Uh, if the OECD thing comes into play, they can somehow sunset the national yes, level stuff and I go with the OECD. Can. Okay, I right, that's can. where we are. Great, thank you. I'd like to bring in Abdul from the South Center. Abdul, you know, you've been really working on this, and the South Center has sort of been leading the charge on the UN uh, proposal, which is what expects every country to bilaterally negotiate with other countries in order to be able to tax. So, uh, and one of the things actually I asked um, Gaini to do is to frame your discussion just to put some numbers that, you know, your reports have cal calculated. Because for countries, one of the big considerations is revenue potential. Where can I m get more tax revenue from which option? So keeping that in mind, could you talk us through, in particular, the UN option and why that might be a preferred solution uh, for countries, Abdul? And can we thank you, unmute? Oh, thank you. Yes, thank you, Helene. Um, good morning, uh, good afternoon, to, and good evening to everyone. It's a pleasure to collaborate with Learn Asia um, at this event. And my greetings to uh, Mr. Matthew Gubanjabul, the co chair of the UN Tax Committee, and I'm honored to share the panel with him, uh, who, in fact, has been um, a champion of the developing countries in taking Article 12B forward. So um, on in response to your question, Helene, as we can see from the data, mm, Article 12B has two methods, the gross method and the net method. And uh, just to highlight that countries don't really need other option. They can just introduce domestic law measures and uh, start collecting taxes. You know, the, the, this thing of that you need a treaty is really uh, this halla balu around a treaty comes more from the developed countries because they want to actually uh, reduce the taxes which their uh, companies face when they, go to a, when they go to developing countries and derive revenues from there. Because tax treaties, they don't grant taxing rights, they restrict taxing rights, I would repeat. Tax treaties don't grant taxing rights, they restrict taxing rights. Even without a tax treaty, the resident's jurisdiction can always give unilateral relief to its uh, taxpayer. So if uh, Uber works in Sri Lanka and Sri Lanka introduces a digital service tax and there's no Article 12B amount, in, if there's no treaty-based solution, the US can always tell Uber that, okay, you pay taxes in Sri Lanka, so we'll take that into account when you pay taxes in the US. So those unilateral relief options are always there and we're there actually, because even now it's not like every country in the world has a tax treaty. So just to mention that even without tax treaties, countries can collect taxes. Domestic law is the basis for collecting these taxes. Even if they have treaty-based solutions, but no domestic law provisions, they cannot collect anything. Uh, tax is a fundamental aspect of sovereignty and this is something countries should keep in mind. Now with that out of the way, if you look at Article 12B, the revenue estimates which we came up with, you have, um, uh, well, the comparison should be with amount A, the 20 billion euro threshold and Article 12B with the two options of ADS only and hybrid ADS. Now, uh, why, why is the UN option a better option by and large for developing countries? One is because if uh, we see most developing countries don't actually have a very big uh, tax treaty network. So it's not like they have so many treaties to renegotiate. You have a few large countries which have lots of treaties, but by and large for most uh, small developing countries, especially the countries in this list, many of them would not have a very extensive treaty network. So it's not like they would have to negotiate so many treaties. And then there's a revenue potential. We can see that Article 12B with a broad scope, ADS companies and hybrid ADS, and ADS is automated digital services like online advertising, income from search engines, income from supply of user data, income from cl cloud computing and things like that. So uh, th that kind of income, uh, if, if a country goes with Article 12B and has, uh, has a broad scope, we can see that it gives uh, almost uh, more than twice, uh, and in some cases up to three times what uh, the OECD solution gives. So in terms of revenue potential with a broad scope, Article 12B has, has, much, uh, has much better uh, revenue potential if you're talking about the gross method. Um, 
But if you look at the narrow scope of if Article 12B has a narrow scope, and by narrow scope, I mean in uh, Article 12B, paragraph 6, you have a list of uh, digital services. And if you look at only those digital services and apply the tax only to those specific digital services, then the amount is comparable with uh, amount A, which would come from the OECD solution. And actually, if you look at the net method, that actually gives the least revenues. And in fact, it gives even less than the OECD solution. So and and what's like the difference between the gross method and net method? Abdul, you're not talking to a bunch of tax people. I think these are very general digital governance audience. So you do need to explain ac acronyms. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so the gross method is basically a digital service tax. So and, and the net method I'll get to in a second. So the gross method was brought in to basic because many countries, as uh, Gayani mentioned, brought in digital service taxes. So the United Nations developed the gross method to provide uh, a treaty-based solution to eliminate double taxation for digital service taxes. So gross method is the same as the digital service tax. The net method, um, you know, what, what the gross method does is that on every payment for a digital service, some portion of that payment is withheld as a tax uh, by the government. So it's a transaction-based tax. It's not that at the end of the year, the company files uh, its uh, files the return and pays the tax at one go. It's on every single payment which is made for a digital service. So for example, if $100 is made for uh, online advertising and you have a 3% rate, then the, uh, the company which is like Google, which is providing the online advertising service would get 100 minus 3, $97 or whatever currency that is. So that's how the gross method would operate. The net method, on the other hand, um, is uh, a tax which is paid at the end of the year. So it's not a transaction-based tax like the gross method. And the way the net method operates is that uh, it provides a simple formula through which the company can arrive at the net profits. And this is important. It's called the net method because net refers to net profits. So they give a formula to calculate net profits. and. Um, this is important because the big question in the digital economy was how do you calculate profits? Because normally if you look at the brick and mortar economy, you have a factory in your country, you can audit, you can see how much do you pay on rent, how much do you pay on salaries and you know your input costs and whatnot. But in, if in the case of Uber in Sri Lanka, where there is no physical presence, how can you audit? I mean, the company can say anything and there's no way you can figure out what the costs are. So, uh, and especially when the uh, whole uh, business model is based on algorithms and intangibles uh, largely, so it becomes very difficult to determine costs. So the article 12B net method provides a simple formula where uh, you basically see how much local revenue has been made by the company. So in the case of Uber and Sri Lanka, how much revenue did Uber derive from Sri Lanka? And to that, the profitability rate of Uber would globally would be applied. So if Uber has a profit margin of, let's say, 10 12%, whatever, that would be applied to Sri Lanka's local revenues. 30% of that figure will be taken. And to that, the local tax rate, uh, Sri Lanka's uh, 25 30%, whatever rate that is, that would be applied. Uh, so that is how the net method operates, uh, broadly speaking. Uh, and because of that, because it's a net basis tax, because it's not a gross basis tax, um, obviously, the revenue collections are, are much lower because, uh, by and large, Turnover-based taxes or revenue-based taxes tend to have much higher revenue collection. Wonderful. Thank you. So, Abdul, you're basically saying as a matter of national integrity, everyone reserves the right. But in terms of being able to negotiate, what do you think are the transaction costs involved? Unless the UN comes up with a treaty with standardized rates, etc., that everyone can sign up to, uh, is it really a matter of Cambodia going and negotiating with China, let's say UK and the US, if those are the three big countries where the platforms come from? Is that what, sort of, yes. is it left up to countries? Yes. yes. So this is the strength of Article 12B, that the decision of uh, which treaty to enter into is left with the country. And now, of course, the question is, can Cambodia really negotiate with China or the UK or the US? And of course, that's not easy and that's very difficult. Mm. But it also depends on how um, Cambodia approaches this. So uh, I've just given disclaimer, you know, the tax world is opposite from the trade world in the sense that in the trade world, developing countries are always looking for market access. We want to export to the developed countries. And there the power is with the developed countries to open the market or not. In the tax world, it's the opposite. 
here the power of tax is always with the developing countries we can tax as much as we want and the developed countries are always trying to reduce the tax which is imposed by the developing countries so in the case of cambodia and china or cambodia and the us if cambodia introduces a digital service tax keeps it out of the income tax law so the tax treaties cannot apply if they introduce it into the finance act as uh, gayani was saying that uh, india nepal and these countries have introduced a digital service tax outside of the income tax law in the finance act if that is done and the treaties don't apply then if china doesn't enter into a tax treaty uh, it doesn't include article 12b into their tax treaty with cambodia it is the chinese companies and the uk companies and the american companies who will face double taxation cambodia will not lose anything so if cambodia doesn't include article 12b no problem it can still collect taxes yeah is market exit by platforms in particularly not valuable countries like on a per user basis or on a gross uh, per country revenue basis a res risk in this scenario you know take that a country like nuae uh, or one or two or something like that right uh, if the transaction costs are that high uh, in compliance would this company stay in is market exit the other risk that you said there is no cost is that a cost uh, I, i mean i didn't mean to say there's no cost of course i meant to say that if um cambodia says that we want to introduce a tax treaty with the uk and the uk refuses then if cambodia introduces a digital service tax keeps it out, outside of the income tax law then they will not lose anything by that it will be the uk companies who will face double taxation so and, and I, i didn't mean to say there is no cost now on this risk that if cambodia introduces a digital service tax will the american companies leave cambodia you know so far we have seen digital service taxes have been introduced by many countries i mean uh, three east african countries for example kenya uganda and tanzania the heads of the revenue service passed a resolution that we will all introduce digital service taxes with a 5% rate yeah. and uh, i mean so far we have not seen this evidence anywhere you know we have yeah. not seen this evidence anywhere that companies have pulled out in response the threat that is usually given and usually not followed up on is that they will pass the costs on to the consumers mm. uh, but as i said even that there is very little empirical evidence that this is a standard practice um, i mean it seems to be more of the exception rather than the rule and also if you remember the business models of many of these companies is uh, i mean they, they burn a lot of cash i mean they are predatory companies <laughs> looking to just destroy their rivals uh, so so often times they are just going with a cash burning approach you know so it's not that the profitability is like the foremost consideration on their minds all the time yeah yeah so sort of dynamic effects of driving others out to the market and so on okay let's bring in matthew now you have taken an interesting approach and you have this dual role can you tell us about the digital services tax that you did impose and what your approach to the oecd sort of you know has been so that the audience understands faced with the real choice of doing something now or waiting what your thought process was yeah thank you very much uh Uh, Hilani, and good morning, um, Abdul, and all colleagues on the call. Um, I think we are having a very uh, interesting conversation, which uh, I hope is going to uh, help our colleagues all over the world to make a choice. Now, um, the, to start with, um, N Nigeria um, does not have a DST. Um, we do not have a digital services tax. um so i think so that we are clear what nigeria has uh, is a nexus rule um that connects um businesses of non resident persons uh to uh nigeria for tax purposes uh, and that gives um the country the um opportunity uh to bring uh the income or the profits arising from transactions done um without physical presence to tax in nigeria now if we come back to the basic um the, we should ask ourselves what is the problem that we're trying to solve uh on this issue of um non physical presence of businesses Uh, 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 which we call high tech and and all of that 
uh, it all has to do with um, being able to bring um, the income in respect of transaction done in a country to tax. Um, before now, um, and when I say now, I mean before the advancement of technology, uh, businesses could only be done if the companies or the firms are physically uh, located in a jurisdiction. And so you can see the business, you can see the premises, you can see the officers, the staff, and then you can see the groups or service. And then you can easily bring such to tax. However, with the advancement in technology, it is possible for a surgeon to be in one country and a patient to be in another country, and yet the surgeon will, perf will, will perform or carry out um, surgery. Um, this was unimaginable 50 years ago. And so question then is, where does the income arising from such service, where should it arise? Should it, should, it, should it be taxed in the place where the surgeon is staying or where the, press, the, 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 the patient is? That, that had always been the problem. And now the approach of um, both the UN and the inclusive framework is to bring in some supposition and which um, just like Abdul said, in respect of the um, UN um, uh, um, treaty base, um, it's difficult a little bit for many um, developing countries to implement. And that is because they don't have that many treaties. Then secondly, um, uh, it is doubtful um, if Nigeria, for example, is negotiating treaty with the United Kingdom or with uh, US or France, that the friends or those countries will accept to have Article 12B uh, in the, uh, as an article in the tax treaty. So it's, it's uh, almost an unsurmountable um, challenge. But even then, if you succeed in doing that, if you don't have a domestic legislation, then you still cannot uh, 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 operate uh, that provision. Now, with the inclusive framework um, um, option of Amont A, we all know the challenges, not just the complexity, but we also saw a lot of um, uh, 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 um, elements that we believe are not uh, working in, 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 in favor of uh, developing countries. And so the option Nigeria has taken is to say, look, what actually is the problem? The problem is I can't see these people but I can feel them. I can see the businesses they are doing in my country. And so we, we therefore uh, 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 used the, 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 the option of looking at significant, significant economic presence to say, look, if you have enough transactions in my country and we have threshold and has exceeded this threshold, um, even whether or not I can see you physically, I would deem that you are in my country and the income arising from that transaction I will be taxable in my country. And that is what we have done. And this is not limited to digital services. Uh, it includes service, other services, uh, management services, technical services, um, and, and all of that. And it is non-discriminatory. So it's not targeted towards any specific company or, or country. It is anyone uh, who fits into the definition that we have. So th that is the approach Nigeria has taken. Uh, and, and I can say uh, uh, clearly that it has worked for all, worked for Nigeria and also worked for the businesses uh, because we also have simplification um, such that they don't have to go through very complex uh, process of filing returns and all of that. So I, I, I hope um, my comment uh, is useful. Thank you very much. Yes, yes. Thank you, Matthew. Just to clarify, what is this test of significant market presence in your case? And how do you actually monitor that, I suppose? Because implementability and monitoring costs are the other side of sort of getting the revenue. Uh, can you give us some thoughts about that? Yeah, yeah, sure, certainly, um, Ilani, and, and thanks. Mm -hmm. um, monitoring and, and, ever, uh, and um, putting values is, is actually not difficult um, uh, because um, we have the financial inter intermediations uh, 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 there, um, if someone sits in one village in Nigeria 
and is transacting business with um, a company that is based either in the US or Russia, um, has to pass through a financial institution. Payment has to pass through a uh, 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 banking system. And so from there, um, um, we, uh, we have a, a hand and, and we can see that. But beyond that, and, and in fairness, uh, quite a number of the businesses are also um, are people of goodwill uh, uh, who on their own um, uh, with proper engagement uh, are able to self-declare to say into your territory, uh, this is how much uh, uh, transactions we have made and this is how much. So it is both ways. Um, we, we are able to get data from our financial services and we also uh, have the, the, the businesses who have come to self-declared on the basis of the law that we have enacted in Nigeria. We, we had a forum uh, with about over 100 uh, government tax officials, I think, last month. And it was interesting, both India and Nepal had imposed uh, digital services taxes um, in-country. But both said they're taking a very light-touch approach because they do really want to sort of encourage compliance but are not really triangulating with all other transactions which they can use across the financial sector, various other ways. Is that Nigeria's approach as well? Um, certainly, uh, the, the intention of Nigeria is not to strangulate businesses. Um, it is just to ensure that taxes are paid where business uh, uh, transactions are carried out and where income or profit is arising, and which is one of the reasons why we had to adopt simplification methods. And we also have adopted rates that, um, uh, that will not um, um, uh, significantly um, affect the profitability uh, of the businesses done in Nigeria. And so, uh, it, yes, I, I would say the intention is not to strangulate business. We do not want to strive uh, strifeful businesses uh, growing up, particularly um, uh, uh, those in the in the technology sector, and, and so. But then everyone still has to pay the fair the fair tax. Great, thank you, Matthew. I'd like to bring in Victoria from the Asian Internet Coalition. So you, in a way, are sort of a industry body for the big platforms that we are talking about today. Uh, are you of the view that? countries should sign up to the OECD Amount A multilateral convention. Uh, why? And also, could you talk about the cost of compliance of the various options um, that from seen from the big tech uh, platforms? Sure, absolutely. And good afternoon, everyone. And, and thank you um, for having me here to, to speak today um, on this important issue. Um, yes, as you mentioned, um, as part of the Asia Internet Coalition, we represent multinational companies that we're, we're talking about here today in this discussion around uh, ta taxing these, these tech titans. And, um, you know, I just want to kind of give a bit of a brief overview of the uh, digital services tax landscape in Asia. Um, so when we look at, at, at this, this landscape and indeed globally, it's clear that there has been, you know, evolving um, digitalization of goods and services. And we recognize the need for, for governments to raise revenue, especially in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic and the fiscal squeeze that Halani mentioned earlier. Um, and in Europe, we've seen several countries passing DSTs um, and while others in Asia, such as Malaysia, India and Pakistan, as Guyani referred to, have introduced taxes on imported digital services. Um, and I think, you know, as was alluded to again in the introduction, these DSTs vary in their scope and their application. And while some countries tax only specific digital activities, others encompass a range of di digital services. But these DSTs can, as you just mentioned, have some potentially harmful consequences. Um, you know, they may distort market behavior. Um, they could potentially pass on costs to the consumers and cause double taxation. Um, so countries have kind of experimented with these taxes in the absence of a global solution um, and as the second best approach. And, and one of the things that we tend to do as part of the Asia Internet Coalition is go to governments with by presenting industry best practices. And one of the ones that we use is often the G20 and OECD inclusive framework. Um, 
So in the, in the context of this discussion, you know, around pillar one, just to be clear, you know, it aims to ensure that profits are taxed in jurisdictions where consumers or users are located. So referring to this surgeon patient uh, analogy that Matthew just, just mentioned. Um, and, and also, as Abdul mentioned, you know, the Global South um, is put in quite a favorable position. It holds a lot of power as there is a huge proportion of the consumer bases of these m and in, in the Global South. Um, so if I think about, you know, whether the, the question that you just asked me around whether big tech co companies are of the view that countries should sign on to the convention, I think that the framework offers a comprehensive and inclusive approach to international taxation um, that holds substantial benefits for various stakeholders, holders, not only multinational companies, but also, you know, some for the global south and the digital economy more generally. Um, but I think we also recognize the need to tailor tax policies to the unique economic, political and administrative landscapes that we're talking about here. Um, so for the global south, I think a couple of the positives that we want to call out are, you know, the redistribution of taxing rights, um, promoting revenue generation in developing countries, and uh, addressing the problems of profit shifting and tax havens and harmful tax practices, which have historically disproportionately affected the global south. Um, I think for multinational companies, which is obviously, you know, the, the the industry that we represent, um, the framework offers clarity and consistency and also transparency in international tax rules. Um, it minimizes tax arbitrage opportunities, and it also reduces this risk of double taxation, which I just touched on briefly. It also resp uh, promotes responsible tax practices from the multinational corporations as well. And I think this is something that countries and consumers are, are starting to expect of companies as well. Um, and lastly, just for the digital economy more generally, the framework addresses some of the unique challenges posed by the digital age. You know, we're seeing huge developments um, in, in, you know, with relation to artificial intelligence, which I'm sure has been a topic of conversation throughout this, this forum. And um, yeah, we're seeing that, that this framework can provide a bit more of a predictable and efficient um, global tax system for the digital economy and its, and its uh, technology companies. Thank you, Victoria. Now, if I were a skeptic, and I'm not saying I am, uh, this could be viewed as a way for the big platforms to just overall pay less taxes because the numbers being talked about are quite low as a global taxation rate. Mm -hmm. uh, and if I were a real sort of negative thinker, again, I may not be, I would think there's no incentive for the US to actually let the OECD agreement reach anything. That's what we saw last year. Uh, well, how would you respond to these two statements? Yeah, I, I, think, I think that's a valid point. And I think around, you know, what um, um, Gayani also um, mentioned around sort of these, these implementation delays and, and sort of the moving goalpost, which we're seeing with this with this inclusive framework, it's, it's completely valid for, for countries to sort of call into question whether this will actually be implemented. But I also think that it's important to recognize that this is an incredibly complex framework that's been put together and one that has is trying to achieve global consensus um, and, and is a major step forward in, in international tax rules. Um, and, and a lot of the work that they've been doing is, is around you know, gaining stakeholder input, not only from the countries that are represented by, you know, um, in the inclusive framework, but also from the industry, from trade associations like ourselves, from NGOs. And this is a, a really lengthy process, but it's ultimately crafted with the view to create long lasting rules and uh, unavoided, un, uh, you know, avoid unintended consequences as well uh, of these rules. So, um, yeah. Abdul, you're on the other side of this debate. How do you react to what Victoria is saying? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Gani. You know, I'll give the background of uh, sort of the context we find ourselves today. This negotiation on the digital economy has been going on since 2013. So it's been going on for more than 10 years. And uh, actually the two, uh, digital economy is part of BEPS action one. Um, out of 15 actions under the base erosion and profit shifting project. And you know, the negotiation would have gone until the end of time. 
because that's what the Americans, uh, especially because most of these companies are American companies. That's what they wanted, that you keep talking, keep negotiating till the end of time and beyond. <laughs> so uh, the only reason why things have come this far is because countries began initiating national measures or as they are called unilateral measures, but all tax measures are basically national measures. It's only when countries began introducing digital service taxes, including, I repeat, many OECD countries, UK, Italy, Spain, uh, France, and Austria, and whatnot, they all started introducing digital service taxes. Then finally, the Americans came to the negotiating table and said, okay, okay. And grudgingly, they agreed to redistribute 25% of residual profits, which are defined as profits above 10% of revenue. So that's a very high threshold in uh, practical terms. So only national measures by countries brought them to the table and only continued national and unilateral measures will actually make this thing see the light of day. The Americans have not even agreed to share tax information. I repeat, the Americans have refused to share tax information on a multilateral basis. They have not signed up to these exchange of information agreements, the MCM, AA and whatnot. They have a history of uh, wasting people's time negotiating these multilateral treaties and then not signing them. So uh, even the BEPS multilateral instrument, which would update tax treaties uh, to implement some of the minimum standards they have not signed. So when they have not agreed to share tax information, can you expect them to agree to share the tax base? And um, it is extremely unlikely. And I would say Victoria was talking about predictability and certainty. If there is one thing which is predictable and certain, it's that the US will not sign this agreement. And based on the current agreement in uh, the July uh, outcome statement, if the US doesn't sign this MLC by the end of the year, then countries uh, can and should actually go ahead with uh, national measures. And in terms of the re revenue potential, and you know, uh, I'd, I'd just like to add another point on that. The companies, they tried very hard you know, to stop developing countries from initiating digital measures. Then they found out that countries are going to go ahead and there was nothing they could do to stop them. So then the next best thing was to come up with this so-called multilateral approach, which would basically force everybody to bring in a tax, which would tax them as little as possible. So that is the key motivation behind this narrative, which we are seeing, basically. Yeah. Matthew, you've done a sort of a national level taxation regime. If and when the OECD optimistically uh, treaty is signed whenever. Are you broadly aligned with that? You have elements of that, right? I mean, significant market presence, for example, is a feature of the OECD. They're not taxing everybody, the large companies. Uh, because you have now sort of committed to the OECD uh, protocol, basically, yes? Uh, um, again, for, for, for clarity purposes, um, Nigeria had been part of the discussions um, since 2014, um, from the time of uh, BEPS um, 15 action uh, uh, points. And um, Nigeria is in alignment with quite a lot of the outcome um, that, um, had is, that is out there. Now, as regards the current two pillar solution, uh, Nigeria has also been part of the discussions from the beginning, and we are still part of it. Uh, but you may remember that in, in the uh, October 2021 uh, statement, um, Nigeria did not sign on to that political statement. And, and that was because we had serious concerns um, with um, quite a number um, of the elements in the rules, um, particularly uh, in, as regard Amont A. And, and, and um, my government has not changed that position even now. Um, of course, we are continuing to engage um, and, and be part of the discussions and the negotiations. Um, but the, the, the decision taken by my government in 2021 uh, had not changed. Thank you. Alison, you've been sitting and listening to this. Um, people who work in tax and the people who are going to have to pay tax talking about it. You work in majority world countries, mostly many poor countries, many emerging economies. From a social inclusion equity perspective, what are your thoughts? From a capacity to get this done, what are your thoughts? And really, if we are ever lucky enough in our countries to get some revenue, what on Earth is going to happen to that money in the kind of regimes that we live in. Uh, 
three-hour discussion, I think. <laughs> um, but, but thank you, Helani. Um, I, I will come to those bigger questions. I, I, I just wanted to say how important it is to be having these discussions and that you know, we've been doing this research over a period of time because the complexity of, particularly with these intensifying global digital, digitalized services and things, um, have made the, the tax issues you know, far more complex. And a lot of the arguments that were made around um, maintaining or reducing or you know, just uh, controlling local uh, tax, uh, taxation on, for example, telecommunication operators so that they could roll out those networks and um, you know, reinvest in those networks and compel them to reinvest in those networks, or the um, failures of secondary taxation through universal service objectives, because in fact those weren't being rolled out, um, and the arguments that you know, kind of let these services drive themselves more affordably and get that take up, and then you'd be able to tax the, you know, corporates and people who are all going online and, and doing that sort of thing. So those arguments, you know, were, were made from a very pragmatic point of view, acknowledging, and our work's all in Africa, um, the incredible constraints there are in revenue generation on the continent. In many of these countries, um, the mobile operators were primarily the tax base for the country, um, with, you know, a, a tax base of one or two percent um, of the population. Um, so those arguments are very different from the arguments that um, you know, we were having even um, 10 years ago, or maybe eight years ago, around the end user taxes that were coming with social networking that was these over the OTT services that were coming on top of the uh, telecom operators were. And there was, a, of course, a lot of um, argument around revenue share with those operators themselves and issues of local competition and all of those things, which I think are completely pertinent to this discussion. I think what's really important about these discussions is that they're not just taxation discussions, that we're actually understanding the implications of taxation on trade you know, trade changes that are happening or on competition issues that are arising because at the moment th that policy is being done in a very siloed way um, that, uh, you know, goes to the issues of national sovereignty but actually the, the, the kind of various imperatives, um, development and, and economic imperatives, you know, the fiscus is looking very strictly at kind of maximizing revenue, the um, d digital department or comms or whatever it is, is very much looking at kind of, you know, digital universal service and those kinds of things that would actually drive economic growth, but they're often not talking to each other. Trade is going off and doing <laughs> a completely separate thing, um, uh, possibly with some kind of alignment on tax, but not, not much else. But then, you know, we had the, the social networking taxes, and, you know, these were enormously re re regressive taxations on end users, um, introduced in some of the poorest countries in the world, primarily, um, with actually very counterproductive effects. So, you know, if you look at you know, Uganda, for example, they were introduced um, at, at a time to get, you know, have a sovereign debt repayment that was needed. Um, so the poorest of the poor, you know, who were on these social networks were actually pushed off the networks with these 1% taxes on each transaction, on mobile transactions and those kinds of things. Not only did it actually undermine their you know, um, digital Uganda um, program, universal service program, but actually it also made the telecoms operators less profitable. There was enormous um, loss of uh, revenues from them from corporate tax. There. So the long-term effect has been quite negative. And then it's overlaid with a, a, a political agenda. So the actual gazette, the regulation that refers to this, it says it's also trying to stop um, uh, uh, go social gossiping, online gossiping and that sort of thing. And around a time of you know, political dissent. So, the, I mean, you, you're getting a whole lot of really irrational um, um, reasons for taxation. Um, so that, you know, that's, that's we, has been, uh, we've made a very strong argument to get not, you know, not taxing end users of these digital services, you're not taxing the titans, you're not taxing the people who, who, should, be, who should be paying for these services. Um, and so often now the discussions around whether countries should be um, signing up to the BEPS um, and at least getting 15% of those um, uh, you know, big tech companies amongst multinational corporations that you know, we have not been able to tax because of the lack of presence in country to use this mechanism to at least get that 15%, which would be very significant in many countries, even with the low internet penetration rates and, the, and those kinds of things. And, and ideally, releasing these you know, end users from those kinds of taxes. And yet some of the people who... You know, as I said, because this is complex and there's not an understanding that 
the social networking taxes in these countries at the moment, mainly in East Africa, are, um, but very attractive to other <laughs> parts of the continent, are actually end-user taxes. There's now often been a, a kind of knee-jerk reaction to taxing digital, um, you know, uh, uh, digital companies under the, the BEPS regime, um, the, the, the base erosion and profit shifting regime of, of OECD's prop um, um, proposed um, regime is, you know, they, oh, we mustn't tax them either because it's going to affect, you know, Facebook's going to move out of, you know, Africa or whatever it is. And I think, you know, we, we really need some complexity because I think we, we're all advocating for the same thing, but we need to understand um, those, uh, th those linkages, you know, and how this whole, whole ecosystem works. And as I said, not only within the digital sector, but um, affecting these other sectors. And so this, th this work was really done in the context of trying to understand um, trade and, um, and taxation issues in, um, in Africa. Um, several interviews done with many, many countries, including Nigeria, and um, working, well, not working closely, but you know, following the work of the African um, uh, Tax Administrators Forum, who obviously represent the interests of many tax administrators across the country and therefore had to represent the um, position on unilateral taxation. I mean, countries like South Africa, for example, you know, corporate taxation is a minimum of 35%. Many of these other companies looking at higher taxation rates. So an offer of 15% is, you know, just doesn't look like, like very much at all. And it has an effective tax regime, you know, a collection regime, etc. Um, so it is, I think it's very different for different countries. As I said, I think it's really important that one understands the different dynamics in these contexts. So for in the, in the African context, besides the issues of, of, of sovereignty, is that I think as um, Abdul was saying, point, pointing out, you know, many of these treaties are, 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 are limiting and binding. They're not um, seen as opportunities to actually be accessing that extra 15% or something. So this, this, this paper that, you know, we interviewed a lot of people and there was a lot of feeling that people, you know, the, the Fiscus would never give up the little hold that they had on something in order that they would get something bigger, you know, or get something later on. Um, and we didn't, certainly didn't want to be tied into these um, moratoriums, which we're seeing anyway, um, you know, from uh, the trade agreements that are impacting on, 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 uh, on, 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 uh, Revenue, um, revenue generation. So I just wanted to say that was a, a kind of work that's been done a lot in Africa, but we've also um, done very important work, I think, um, with Learn Asia and with IEP, um, in the, you know, across um, the issues that I think we really need to understand where taxation fits in. Um, really looking at the interplay between digitization, um, uh, you know, increased visibility to the state, state formation, you know, revenue generation, taxation, redistribution, because I mean, we, we need those taxes to do the redistributive work that we're wanting to do post COVID, you know, well, during COVID and of course post COVID around um, economic reconstruction. And that paper is actually out um, being launched today. So please do watch our Twitter feeds for that. Um, because I think, you know, the, the um, visibility that's coming through um, digital transactions has implications that can be used positively, both to, um, for people who currently might not be um, you know, paying legitimate taxes um, to be more visible to the state, but also for um, informal sector who have often not been able to be the beneficiaries of redistributive programs because they're not visible, now being increasingly visible um, through tax, and obviously not don't qualify for taxation, so they'd be visible but um, from, a, from a tax point of view, but they wouldn't qualify, unless they don't, unless they do, um, qualify for taxation, but then be visible in, in the social protection role. So that's, I think, an important side from the you know, ongoing post-colonial struggles around state formation in many of our countries and the need to have the revenues to build those institutional capacities um, you know, and some of these really big development challenges um, that, we, that, that we face um, on the continent. Um, but I think, as I said, that I, think, I think specifically in terms of the um, uh, taxation issues and the trade issues that are going on now, I think, well, you know, the, the whole um, BIPS process was actually an acknowledgement of how outdated these tax systems are. Um, but it's important to notice that, you know, the foregone potential revenues for states, um, particularly in the context of the pandemic, as I mentioned, and economic reconstruction, 
Um, but it, you know, it's, it's compelled us to look at updating the tax system, of engaging in these various processes, um, and, and better representing our interests, which I think we've not been effective as, as regions, as, global, as, as the Global South. And doing this kind of research to inform a more integrated position for countries and regions to take is very important. Um, for, for Africa, I think the situation is even, even more precarious. As I said, very um, uh, fragile or non-existent tax systems in place anyway, um, largely dependent on aid and with all the associated issues that that raises for the, you know, political economies. Um, but then we've also got these big uh, you know, um, uh, continental and international trade um, issues where we are seeing, you know, enormous amounts of foregone tax in a, in a in agreement. So the African Continental Free Trade Area, which has come into force, although it's not operational in, in many ways, but there is expected to be a significant drop in um, conventional physical trade, although I should say that <laughs> there's a sad amount of intercontinental trade anyway, so a lot of our trade is actually um, outside, but you know, that, that will have significant effects, especially for those countries who are not highly digitized, not leading these digital services um, um, you know, um, uh, spreading out, you know, spreading out throughout throughout Africa, and as as this trade be, um, these trade barriers begin to ease across the region, and e-commerce is you know taking off, and the protocol, um, the digital services protocol, is just being negotiated right now um, for the African continental free trade area. Um, you know, we we we're, we're going to see those kinds of impacts um, of a digital single market um, on traditional trade um, taxes that, that have been there. Um, and so this really makes this, you know, this assessment of, of, of aligning, positioning our uh, local tax regimes um, on the continent, um, some kind of harmonization we would have to have in terms of the continental free trade area and the digital services underpinnings of it um, with the international tax regime, because these are essentially, um, you know, digital global digital public goods that we're very often talking about, data um, flows and these kinds of things. Um, and I think, you know, historically we've looked at global governance from a kind of harms and protection point of view. We've looked at, you know, uh, from a kind of trade and digital services and e-commerce point of view. Um, but the taxation component of this, the actual generation of revenue for countries in order to um, service their needs. And I think, you know, historically we used to be, you know, don't put a secondary tax on telecom operators unless it goes back to the digital industry because otherwise we never see it. But digitization is now so cross-cutting that it's absolutely appropriate that if proper taxation of, you know, the um, extraction of data and stuff that's coming in, you know, across sectors in Africa actually is used by governments responsibly to, um, to service um, the, their populations. Um, and so, as I said, I, I think um, although there's been um, a strong feeling from our research that people are, will continue to pursue unilateral regimes while these other agreements go on, um, you know, the, the, the world trade uh, negotiations, for example, with the moratorium on um, uh, taxation, effectively, on, on, on various mechanisms while the um, e-commerce uh, protocols are, are, are negotiated, and now that they've been so protracted, it has been a ne very negative in um, signal, not necessarily incentive, but signal to those other countries who, by and large, in Africa did not, have not signed up, um, or to the BEPS, for that matter, if they're continually pushed out, um, because they put into such a negative position in, in the interim with having to, you know, to put a, have moratoriums on these things. So I think these, you know, these are absolutely uh, critical um, aspects. And you, if you're discussing the global in, um, international tax, you need to be looking that in the context of a country where, you know, it's being used um, on end users, on poor people, um, you know, effectually a re very regressive tax. That is, um, you know, they're being taxed anyway, um, but but very in a, a very negative way rather get that tax from the people who are becoming, you know, the wealthiest in the world and allow it to be um, effect more effectively um, redistributed um, to meet the needs of countries. Thank you, Alison. An interesting point you bring about, about the attractiveness of at least getting the 15%, um, even though, you know, you might have other options to get a lot more, but if you sign up with this and if this comes to fruition, the BEPS or the OECD, might give you something, whereas other option might maybe nothing or a whole lot, right? Okay, we are happy to open up to comments. 
thoughts as well as questions from the audience. Um, I know it's a bit of a, you know, esoteric and complex issue. Uh, you can do it online. You can come up to the, uh, ah, we wonderfully set up mics. If you would say your name and organization and either ask a question from one person or give your thoughts or anyone. Hello, good, good afternoon. My name is Mwendwa Kivuva from Kiktanet, Nairobi, Kenya. And Kenya is one of the countries where digital taxation has been introduced. And when digital taxation came, actually, it had mixed reactions. Some organizations pulled out of working from Kenya. For example, some cloud service providers, they terminated services. And users who were hosting their content in those services had to look for alternative places to host their content. But of course, others, for example, Netflix, actually reduced the cost so that they can have critical mass of users joining the bandwagon. So we are wondering what is the balance that countries should take? Because as, as it right, has been rightfully put, that organizations, uh, countries need to survive, and the only way governments generate income is through taxation. So foreign, the, the, the local regime the local government say that foreign organization cannot just go to developing countries and extract resources, and there's no benefit that is put back to the, to the economy. So what is the balance that should be put in place so that probably there is a sweet spot for both? And number two, what happens when, when these organizations, the foreign organizations, don't respect the jurisdiction of poorer countries. So for example, they still continue extracting resources and they don't want to pay taxes because our tax regime is usually voluntary, voluntary tax regime. So when these orders have been put in place or these laws, but these com com companies are still not obeying those, those orders. So at Kiktanet actually, at the end of this month, we are holding a session in Nairobi on digital taxation. And this is actually from requests from multinational companies, the big techs. They are saying that the tax regime has become uh, challenging and also expensive to, to comply. So they want us to engage the stakeholders, uh, the public and the government so that there is a common understanding on these issues. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I'll actually let anyone from the panel respond. Um, Abdul, Matthew, Victoria, Alison, and Gaini. Yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks, Eleni, and um, uh, uh, thanks for, for, for the two questions. Um, I think the first question um, is, um, is, is the policy issue uh, of government. Um, in striking a balance uh, between investment and generating revenue for government. Uh, and it is important that uh, in aiming for where to put the dot, um, the government uh, would need um, to consider a whole number of things, uh, which should include um, what minimum level of revenue is required to run basic services. And also uh, to also understand that um, um, we can't tax businesses out of existence uh, because if you do that, uh, it's like you killed the tree uh, uh, and then you, you, you can't come around the next year to get fruit on it. So uh, uh, th that's, this is where the, the delicate balance is. Uh, and that is where um, uh, these are the various options. I mean, if you are uh, listening to Gayani in, in our opening um, our presentation, um, I've given a, a, a spectrum um, between um, domestic unilateral actions or measures and multilateral measures. Um, uh, so you, you should be able to find somewhere in between where you believe um, you are able to strike the balance. But then there is no silver bullet that works for everyone. 
uh, every economy uh, has to determine what works uh, uh, for it. And then as regards measures um, um, to ensure compliance, uh, I think the starting point, and I'm happy with what Kenya is about to do, is um, to engage. Um, and one of the things Nigeria did um, uh, in 2019, after we um, enacted the um, SCP rule, uh, was to engage uh, with um, various stakeholders. And, 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 um, uh, and, and surprisingly, uh, uh, most of the uh, non-resident um, suppliers to Nigeria were willing to cooperate and collaborate with Nigeria. So I, I think uh, engagement is one big route. Uh, second thing is to also uh, ensure that there is simplicity in the rules and that people are able to comply with minimal costs. Thank you very much. Um, if I could uh, go after Matthew, uh, uh, Helene, if that's okay. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gubanjubola, for that. I uh, just have three points on the questions raised by the gentleman from Kenya. One is that, to my knowledge, uh, Kenya initially introduced a digital service tax which applied to both residents and non residents, but then later on they uh, restricted it to non residents. So it's only the foreigners who now have to pay the tax. Um, so that option is always there with countries. Second point is that uh, on extraction, you know, in the in the digital economy, you can really see extraction in a raw form because uh, the classic argument that if you have taxes, then investment will go away uh, kind of breaks down when we look at the digital economy because these are not coming with money to set up a factory and hire local people and create jobs. These are by definition companies. I mean, as in the case of Uber with Sri Lanka, they have literally no physical presence over there. The only jobs which are being created, so to speak, are the Uber drivers who could get those jobs even from Pikmi and other local companies. Uh, and in the case of online advertising companies like Google and Facebook, then you can really question, you know, what is the actual investment coming into the local economy? So this argument that raise taxes investment goes away uh, should be seen very differently when it comes to the digital economy. And we can really see, as I mentioned, extraction in quite a raw form. The third point which the Kenyan gentleman had spoken about was non-compliance. Uh, one option which is there for countries is what Pakistan has done, which is where they have told the banks that you collect the tax as a withholding and give it to us. So in the case of uh, Kenya, for example, the company has to on its own come and pay the tax. Uh, and, you know, of course, if they don't, then there, there are compliance issues. But there's always a Pakistan approach where the banks withhold it. So the company basically gets, uh, you know, gets, gets the balance. Yeah. Victoria, anything to add? Yeah, I think if I can uh, jump in here, I, I also want to reiterate the point that Matthew made around the importance of stakeholder engagement. I think it's hugely important um, so that both the government and multinational companies can set expectations. Um, but you said that um, companies you know, came to you with some concerns around you know, the complexities of, of the arrangement that you have in Kenya. And I think this is where, you know, global tax rules can come in to reduce the complexity and uncertainty faced by MEs uh, due to sort of varying tax regulations um, and to sort of facilitate more transparent and predictable tax governance for them, as well as, um, you know, simplifying compliance by providing more standardized and, um, you know, consistent approaches to allocating profits. Um, and this is where MEs can more easily determine their tax obligations. Um, and ensure compliance across multiple jurisdictions. Alison, Gaini. I can just uh, respond on a softer approach on the second part of the question, um, on what if the companies don't want to pay taxes. And I just want to uh, reflect on a conversation that we had with the Nepali and Indian authorities when we had our forum a couple of weeks ago. And uh, what those tax officials said is that so far they've had the companies actually playing ball and paying taxes, though they've taken a relatively light touch approach like Hilani mentioned earlier. So it's though so far they've had little issues, but the light touch approach was key. But the question really is, is this dynamic going to change if and when the amount a convention comes into place? Because then there's an alternative. So these are also questions that we'll have to keep asking in whether the sort of answers that we're giving today also continue to be sort of static and stagnant or whether those also will change over time.
so, so I think that was just one of the points I wanted to make because I think the, one of the issues you are speaking about, and I think one of the issues that have come up here, are really the issues around um, being able to tax the big tech, comp tech, you know, tech companies in our, in our context that don't have presence within country. And, and you know, you're saying, oh, well, they, they're playing ball, um, uh, you know, uh, as they should. If you're looking at the kind of super profits that these companies are, are, are making, you know, the, the kind of gratitude that actually they're <laughs> contributing to these taxes just seems to be, you know, it's really not addressing these kind of bigger problems. I mean, I think, yes, we must take and risk it, that it must be fair, it must be transparent, but in fact, you know, although the, the kind of agreed international formula on this would make things clearer, it's not worked in the favor of some of those, those countries. So we really need to, and we've got, you know, the US holding out on things. So, you know, in, unless everybody kind of comes to the table and we agree on it and it's binding on everybody, um, you know, the, then it's never going to get the kind of traction um, that, that we're looking for. Thank you. We've got uh, an in-person question. You have a question as well. We'll take two questions very quickly with very short answers. Okay. Um, hi. So, excellent panel and excellent discussion. Um, I'm learning quite a lot of things here. Um, I'm Bagisha. I'm a PhD scholar and I work with Internet Governance Project at Georgia Tech. Now, what I'm going to ask might be a little bit more fundamental because I'm still learning about digital taxes, so please bear with me. I am struggling to understand how the calculations of profits are done or how the calculation of tax itself is done in sense that I think Abdul mentioned initially about um, you know, revenue from profits for services. It's easy when you have to calculate it for Netflix or something because you're paying for those services, but how is it done for um, a service such as a social media website where we're not directly paying for anything, right? And I think you also mentioned about how this trickles down to, uh, to something that a user ends up paying uh, for a Netflix or a another digital subscription services. So just more fundamentally on how does one uh, conceptually think about this? And um, yeah, that's, okay. that's about it. Thank you. I'm Kusi Amesinu from Benin. I'm from Ministry of Economy and Finance. It's not very clear for me now. Facebook is not physical in Benin, for example. But many people using Facebook service, how can we, can we tax Facebook? Please make me information detail by detail, step by step, because my minister are waiting for that. Thank you. <laughs> There's also a question online. My name is Kunle. My question is for digital companies, how do you quantify how much they are to pay based on the fact that most of them are operating remotely? You're getting at this. So, I mean, this has to do a lot with uh, what are the costs Facebook, what is the cost and revenue uh, of Facebook in a country like yours? Uh, advertising revenue and subscriptions like SMEs pay, you know, to have a certain type of page. We might buy advertising space to announce that, I don't know, we're running a conference, um, uh, hotels might buy advertising space. What are their costs? Are marketing, maybe some allocation of the policy staff, the marketing staff, which might be per country or shared across countries. I mean, th those are the types of costs and revenues that uh, these com companies have, even if they don't have a, a presence. If they have a presence, then of course, there's sort of, you know, infrastructure that they run and so on, yeah? So I'll take a very quick uh, set of responses, like really under one minute from the panelists, but I am going to put you in touch with Abdul so you can have a longer conversation. Um, uh, because I think that is important part of what we're really trying to do with the panel. This is one of the first panels at IGF, and I've been coming since 2006, that's really trying to get at some of the detailed elements of this. So we need to have a much longer conversation. So we will put you in touch. Reactions from panelists, please. Thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you, Helene. I'll uh, just respond to the gentleman from Benin. Um, I would say, uh, sir, please look at the equalization levy of India. Uh, where they basically started out with a 6% tax on online advertising, which was targeted at Facebook uh, and Google and these kinds of uh, companies whose main revenue stream is from advertising. Broadly speaking, tell your bank that if somebody in Benin is paying Google for online advertising, 
then introduce a rate of four or five percent or whatever and tell that bank to withhold that percentage as a withholding and keep it as a, as a withholding tax whether facebook or google are there or not in benin that doesn't matter the money will be restricted from them when they receive the payment and they will be forced to come and file the tax return and if they don't well that's their loss so before the money goes out of the country the financial institutions are legally obliged to have a withholding tax and then remit it back to the tax authorities what abdul is saying uh Anyone else wants to respond? Or we can go to our last sort of rapid fire. Uh, we've had very sort of, you know, interesting, there's some convergence, right? Abdul is basically saying national levels taxation is important because that is what actually brought the US and other people to the table. And we need to do this. It is also a matter of national integrity. There seem to be outs if, you know, somehow we have a longer term, you know, multi, Tree, sort of country treaty option. Uh, Matthew is broadly, I think, along those lines. He's gone for an approach that somehow, sort of, I think the devil is in the details, which, you know, we, we really do see. He's sort of had a threshold, so the smaller guys are not really impacted by this, but has, still has a mechanism to get revenue. Victoria is saying, I think, that um, this is sort of the OECD option is really a viable one. Compliance becomes easier. And related to that, Alison is actually saying that, you know, uh, the countries stand to gain something because it's sort of like you can free ride along with this if this treaty happens, right? So it's a really interesting negotiation position of what the long-term game is and what might be the short-term approach that countries use. So we don't have conclusions. I want you to say in, you know, a sort of a 10 word tweet, Abdul, Matthew, Victoria, Alison, what country should do. And then we're going to run a poll asking you in the audience what country should do. So let's get the slider up, but let's start with Matthew. Very quickly, what should be the approach of developing countries given these options? Should they sign up for the OECD treaty and wait? Uh, I would say that um, developing countries should look very clearly, uh, read between the lines, um, if they intend to sign, and to be sure uh, of the specific impact on their uh, revenue. Okay, so you're saying I don't know, but look at it closely. Abdul. Wait for the US and other OECD countries to ratify amount day before thinking of how to proceed. Okay, so don't commit until US and other countries ratify. Victoria. Uh, I think that without a global consensus-based solution, the risk of further uncoordinated unilateral measures and retaliatory trade sanctions is a real concern. So you're saying, yes, please sign up for the OECD. Alison. Yes, I'm also saying sign up for the OECD, but very conditionally. Yes. I think that if enough countries sign up and there's enough pressure put, then there's a kind of block that can actually force these um, percentages higher so that they begin to align mm. with what corporate taxation would be in their countries. And maybe that requires a digital multinational um, corporation okay. pull out of the 15%, because obviously that's not applicable to Big, you know, yeah. multinational corporations that just aren't these big giant monopolies. So conditional, yes. Yeah. Uh, Gaini. Uh, no, by the end of 2023, so very much like what Abdul is saying. Because Don't only sign up to the OECD only, only for 30, now. Only 30 countries and with 60% of the market share need to sign up. Global South doesn't fall into that basket, so it's not necessary. Mm. They can wait and see. So and we can free ride later. essentially and wait exactly. for that. Okay, excellent. What does the audience think? The slider is gone. Could we please go to... Okay, slido.com, and the number for the poll is 2823924. Should countries sign up for the OECD amount a multilateral convention by the end of 2023? Half of the audience says no. Ah, interesting. So close to a split opinion, I think, given the small sample size. 42% saying yes. And just under 10 percent, oh, okay, more, more moving towards no. Uh, this is a live situation, but still around 8 percent, I don't know. Okay, so I think it's quite close, which thinks, you know, it's a good thing. We need to keep engaged on this. 
Thank you, guys. Thank you for um, staying. We're just on time. Thank you for the questions and the audience and the really good panel engagement on this. And we'll hope to see you next year with a much more sophisticated understanding of what we should do. Thank you.